Oh, well, I'll do this. Good morning. As a resident of Minneapolis and a supervisor in this region, I want to add to the welcomes that you've received. It's great to have you in our city that we love. And um, the next time you come around, I think it'll be even better as we get Nicollet Mall figured out. Um, so we're looking forward to having that for you the next time you come back. I just want to put in a plug for those of you going to the Guthrie. There is a remarkable, I don't even know what it's called, but it's an extension out uh, two, three floors up. You can go outside, look over the river. It's not to be missed. So be sure you get there in time to go out and uh, experience that in the Guthrie. So now I'd like to um, invite you to uh, quiet yourselves for this introduction. You're going to be invited into an experience of mind and body. And we have a wonderful person here to help us do that. And the second time I met this person, Matt Sanford, it was at a three-day workshop called Yogic Principles in Healthcare. And at the end of that workshop, he invited all of us who were present to talk about what is the takeaway that we're going to bring back into our work. And the takeaway came for me right away. And what came into my mind was spiritual care is the art of navigating sensation. Sensation was the word in the experience that really had grasped me through that whole weekend. And of course, three days later, I was doing a didactic with our residents on sensation. Matt Sanford is a master of sensation. He has known the best of sensation as a yoga teacher who works remarkably with the nuances of anatomy and of subtle movement. And he has known the terrifying worst of sensation as one of three ma family members to survive a car accident in which his father and his sister were killed. The first time I met Sa uh, Matt came through the reading of his book a number of years ago, a book in which he, says, he states this, it took a devastating car accident paralysis from the chest down, and dependence on a wheelchair before I truly realized the importance of waking both my mind and my body. This awakening came to Matt after 12 years of an agonizing medical journey, a journey that is chronicled in the book I mentioned, Waking, a Memoir of Trauma and Transcendence, and I highly recommend this as a CPE book. It's a remarkable, uh, painful, uh, profound look into healthcare and the experience of one patient. With a story like Matt's that is so sad and tragic, it's easy to get drawn into the loss and the hardship that have unfolded Matt and his family. But Matt's message isn't about his accident and it isn't about his disability. His mission is to help you and me and thousands of others experience the rush and the wisdom that come with the mind and the body's meeting. So it's not surprising that Matt has spent a lot of his more recent years focusing on healthcare. Within our own organization, he has met with dozens of departments, and his footprint is all over Park Nicollet Healthcare. And in the wake of one of his workshops, you're going to see all kinds of strange behavior happening. You're going to see people laying down in their offices with bolsters doing heart openers. You're going to see nurses clutched in the corner with one of them stabilizing the other with a hand in the back. You would see our CEO inviting his vice presidents to ground their feet prior to looking at the financials. Matt has worked nationally and internationally with all kinds of organizations, healthcare and otherwise, and he's invited them to wake up to the body-mind connection, and his recognitions are too numerous to mention. But Matt's real passion is yoga. He's a great overall, all-around yoga teacher. I, as a practitioner of yoga, for years I have hated Warrior Two. And in Matt's class, 
during yoga too, as I was suffering as I always suffered, he said, pay attention to the benevolence of space between your legs and under your arms. Benevolence of space. It changed everything for me in that posture. So thank you for that, Matt. What's more, Matt is a pioneer in the field of adaptive yoga. He runs a nonprofit here in Minnetonka named Mani B Body Mind Solutions. And the mission there is, I quote, dedicated to transforming trauma, loss, and disability into hope and potential by awakening the connection between mind and body. In our culture and place of work, places of work that places so much emphasis on what's wrong with the body, Matt's work is about helping us to discover what is right with the body when the body and the mind connect. And what I love about Matt is that he's a very real, genuine human being. He's a husband and father, he's kind, he's passionate, and like many in this room, he is a straight shooter. He's the same person in the yoga studio, in the grocery store, in the boardroom. He's just a very real person. So I'm excited for you to meet Matt Sanford, and I invite you to listen not only with your minds, but also with the sensations that you experience in your body. Please welcome Matthew Sanford. Gotta get some water quick. It's an amazing honor to be here. Um, it's an honor to be with people that are trying to help other people. Um, the impulse to give and serve is one of the most important impulses on the planet, for sure. Um, but it also comes with a cost. You know the cost, you live it every day. Right, so, and, and what it is to keep answering the bell, what it is to keep giving, things of that nature. And what I want to, one of the things I want to get across in the time we have together is that what you need to thrive is also exactly what your students need to thrive, your, your residents, but also what the patients need to receive. That we're in the same existence. And what we really need is company. One of the things that's ha starting to ha happen too much in healthcare, I think, is that is the expectation that the system is supposed to fix. No, you can never, and I, I'll talk about my story in a little bit. Um, you can't ever, I live with a chronic disability, obviously. Um, you can't fix me. You can only teach me to fish. And what does that mean? How do you do that? How do you, and this is a question that all of you have wonderful answers to, you have your own practices. Um, how do you su truly support another human being? That's one of the questions I wanna like really start with. And how does the support happen mentally, spiritually, but also within the body? Because by the way, the only thing that'll never leave you in your life is your body until it's over. It's the body that actually remains faithful to living, not your mind. It's minds that waver. With every ounce of energy, your body is going to move towards living for absolutely as long as it can. And yet people that are going through and living through a lot of pain, especially physical, get angry at the body, like it's letting them down. No, no. Whatever happens to your body, it didn't ask for what's happening. The, the body, I think, is underrealized as a vehicle of realization in a big way. And without the grounding of the body, the mind doesn't function. And that's just the truth. So how do we rethink what we do and how we give care, including the body 
more and more. And my hope today is to do a couple of things, is to tell you a little bit about my story, but also um, try to help you think a little bit about how to teach this, how to share it with others, because that's part of it. And I, you know, in another, you know I, you, quite frankly, I wish all of you would be in um, my more experiential workshops, because at the end of the day, it comes down to what you experience. Um, we're going to try to do some interactive stuff here together, so beware. You might even be asked to touch each other. <laughs> it's going to be okay. It's going to work out. And it turns out that I'm pretty sure you've never served anybody without a body just so you know. And we're freaked out by bodies. And it's a shame. It's a shame. All right. So as Scott said, I would say, and it's a weird thing to say about yourself, but I, I, I've been studying mind-body sensation for a long time. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about my story as to why and how. But the idea of that, and there's a lot of things out there that are trying to, modalities that are trying to do this, you know, mindfulness being one. But that's different than what I'm talking about. And that'd be a good thing to ask me in the question and answer part. <laughs> right? Like, and careful, because I might go on a monologue of that there are truths that that travel from body to mind, that honest to goodness, the mind can't realize on its own. Not everything can be mindful. That's a throwback. I know there's, Scott told me that a lot of you are, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a trained academic philosopher, so I apologize for that in advance. But the idea that mindfulness can take care of everything is Descartes again. <laughs> again and again. And now neuroplasticity is Descartes again and again and again. It's like, oh my goodness, when are we going to try to uh, stop making the mind a causal player against the body? When are we going to change that story? It's a dangerous story. It leads to violence in a lot of different forms. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about, you know, you know obviously I've spent a lot of time integrating mind, body, mind and body, but also I'm here to share you some hopefully some experiential insights about what it is to live in a body. Because although you live in a body and you go through your whole day, I'm pretty sure there are things you're missing, right, about living in a body. And this has implications for the human metaphysic. What it is to live in a body, what it is to be in space, and most importantly, what it is to be connected. Because I want to say something that sounds a little bit, I'm going to, Scott told me I could take some of the filters off my mouth, right? <laughs> is, that, is that the mind is the organ of disconnection. That's what it's for. It, that is what it's for. It's to find an object in relationship to a subject. It's, that's, and it's, it's a great evolution on this planet. It's probably what we're trying to whether you think it's literally true or not, it's probably what we're trying to say in the fall from the Garden of Eden, is that we separate it. But that's what it's supposed to do. That's how it can think. That's how it can see possibility. That's why I can think about tipping over that chair, is because I'm separate from the chair, and I can tip it over. Now, as a yogi, I'm going to tell you that I think the spine is the organ of connection. Literally that it's emanating your life force in every direction. You, it travels through the nervous system for sure. I'm not saying anything, whatever, right? But it's the organ that is visibly connected and is actually in need of more support. Not just treatment, not just a chiropractor. Why is it? I mean, this seems like such an odd question. Why is it, does it feel, why does it feel so good to get in bed? Have you thought about, like, it's so simple. Because a horizontal relationship to support is actually more nourishing than a vertical one. Duh. <laughs> right? 
But it's funny, we don't think this way. We're not thinking this way, right? We're not actually thinking, how is it that I support another human being? Is it that I fluff their pillow? Or do I actually figure out ways that they can inhabit their body? Because another thing I'll tell you is that when mind starts disconnecting from body, anxiety is the result, right? That's just a real simple truth, right? So I'm here to try to like figure out how to help the body be a greater part of your curriculum without every, everybody having to become a yoga student because that's not gonna happen. There isn't, you, you're already all really busy. You have a lot of training, right? But how do we figure out how to include the body more directly in what we're doing? Um, so one of the things that Scott mentioned, I am, if you're to Google yoga and disability, I'm probably the guy that comes up. Like I've been teaching yoga, uh, you know, I was injured in 1978, and I started teaching, practicing yoga in 1991, started teaching in 1996, and as far as I know, no one's ever um, taught as much with such an overt disability as me. I literally live a mind-body problem. Like it's harder for me to be in my whole body. If you tickle the bombs of my feet, I don't feel it. If I tickle the bombs of you, your feet, you feel it. I live with intangible sensation in my body at all times. So think about that for a second. Within the, my own domain, there's a whole bunch of stuff I don't get to control. Talk about a teacher, oh yeah. How do you integrate what you can feel and control with what you can't feel and can't control? That's one of my definitions of yoga. That that's what you're being asked to do. When we talk about what healing is, what human resilience is, what faith is, it's an integration of the intangible level of the mind-body relationship with the tangible level of the mind-body relationship. That's where the true strength and resilience resides. How do we access that? Not only in patients, but to help the people you're training find their voice. To not be afraid of vulnerability because the mind is scared of vulnerability. The body just goes through time, right? There are a whole bunch of things that I wanna like try to help you think about things you've already gone through, but thinking about them a little bit differently today. So I also do a lot of training, as Scott said, with people in healthcare. And there's a reason for that. And you're gonna hear about my personal story and what it is to live in this body and how there's levels of sensation that we're not rehabilitating and we're not treating as people go through acute care and through the rehabilitation model. So that this is gonna be a very personal. I'm not someone that learned what I did out of books, I'm, although I'm trained as an academic philosopher. It's been experiential for me, right? So that, that's one of a big part of my teacher, but I've been teaching healthcare professionals because I figured out that when people are coming through healthcare, they are in an extraordinary state of vulnerability. There's nothing, you are losing so much power and control in a hospital. It's mind numbing. And I need to somehow stay grounded. Even though the variables, the external variables of my experience are out of my control. That's why we put so much faith in doctors and the healthcare professionals and expect them to fix everything. It's because the state is extraordinary. And part of what I want to get, and, there, and in the model what I work with is that there aren't that many places where the transformation of vulnerability isn't just seen as psychological. I think one is pastoral care. I think you're actually crucial to some of the real frontier of true healing and healthcare in the future. And it's affordable, right? Yeah. We don't need another $10 million diagnostic equipment. We gotta figure out how I leave the hospital more resilient, more engaged in healing. It's about human relationship. Where I think part of what I see is some of the weakness with some of the market changes in healthcare. It's the relationship 
that is the hope of transforming healthcare, right? And that's something that we want to, and there aren't that many places where more authentic human contact occurs. Pastoral care is going to be one of a major player in getting human beings to step into their own healing, right? Okay, so, yeah, yeah. I'm, I know I'm talking to the choir here. But I also know a lot of you are very intellectual. Your training has been about education. You've been trying to do things more through your heads than you even know. And that's okay. I'm a heady guy too. It's okay. Don't be ashamed. There's time still, thank goodness. Um, but in this training, so we do train for healthcare professionals. In this training, one of the things, because what I figured out is that to get it to the patient, I have to get it to the healthcare professional, right? Mind-body integration, a more grounded body, and which means that I've got to figure out a way to make it make sense to the people that control the money, okay? Which is tricky, right? So what I know is that they're having, because of the constraints in healthcare, right? And it's not going to change anytime soon. It's only getting worse, it looks to me. I see tremendous compassion fatigue, tremendous medical burnout all over the country. People are coming apart. The employees are also coming apart. So when I go in and try to teach things that I say, we're going to help your job turnover. We're going to help you, your, your employees feel like they have more energy to get through their whole day. We're going to actually improve customer satisfaction by getting a more engaged employee. But I'm in my mind, as you'll hear in a second, I'm very, like, I'm trying to get it to the patient. But I know that your faith and my faith, the caregiver and the patient, are deeply symbiotic. It's not just that caregivers need to self-care more. It's that they have to recognize that the healing relationship that I need depends on you being healthy. It's necessary. And it's not just self-care. It's healing. So I go around watching people all needing to heal. I see both sides suffering, the patient and the caregiver. That's part of how I try to get traction in an organization. But again, I want to try to get it also to the patient. So um, one of the couple of questions we ask in the beginning of our training um, is, do you know how to sit in the presence of suffering without trying to fix it? Now this. I would imagine this group in this room right now is pretty good at that. Except the part you don't fully admit. But we won't talk about that. It's, you know, I know you have a secret about how hard this is, what you do. I know that. Right, and part of it is how do we figure out how to help you transform in the exact same way that the patient needs to transform. That's part of what I'm interested in. The other thing is that, um, do you know, so sitting in the presence of suffering without trying to fix it, that's a whole, that could be a whole day. The other one is, do you practice giving and receiving simultaneously? See, there's a pattern to what I'm doing. I'm trying to simplify things. Do you practice that? Do you study the sensation of support? Does your study of the sensation of the support include the body? These are some of the questions that I want to be thought about more. Remember, there's a reason why it, feel, why it feels good to be horizontal for your spine and how it calms the mind down, right? That there's reasons why we lay down, why we stand up, why we sit. It's deeper than, than what we typically think. And I'd also say that supporting another human being, all three of these things, being able to sit in the presence of suffering, being able to give and receive simultaneously, which is another word for that would be, do you know how to give without sacrificing? Which is part of the, 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 the relationship that's gone out of whack for a lot of caregivers. They're giving and sacrificing, and you can't sustain that, right? And the third one is supporting another human being. I, all three of them 
I think are mind-body realizations. They're not psychological realizations. They're not physical realizations. They're mind-body realizations. And that's where I want to launch out. But before we get too far, I know that one of the concepts, I'm going to talk a little bit at the end here about concepts of presence, which is part of the curriculum, and also the use of self. I've been talking to Scott, trying to understand your language, right? And we're going to try to hit there at the end. But just for a second, I want to define what I would call mind-body presence or presence, right? So everyone just sit back in their chair and slouch, right? Let your legs split. Remember, I'm a yoga teacher. I'm going to reserve to teach yoga poses the whole time, right? Take a picture of what this feels like in your legs, like feel it. And now sit up straight and tall. Scoot out to the edge of your chair more. Press down through your inner heels. Do you feel your inner thighs more? Lean back if you didn't notice, right? That's what happens when your spine goes behind gravity. When gravity is not being a player in your body awareness. It, your body awareness is just sitting there. Now sit up straight and tall again. Press down through your inner heels. Now do you notice your inner thighs? Right? I call that the forgotten country. <laughs> There's a reason why we're having so many low back problems. It's because we're actually not living in our legs enough. Sounds so, what do you mean? No, really. There's using your legs and then there's living in your legs. And they're different. And part of why there's so much fatigue in healthcare is the caregivers are getting so caught and distracted and multitasking that they're actually not living in their feet enough. And it's pretty simple, but it's a practice that has to be learned. How do you live more groundedly in your feet as you move through a chaotic day? This is a simple way to think about it. Um, so what I, now lean back again. You think that's relaxing, but it isn't. Your neck's going to be sore in about 10 minutes. The difference between what you feel here and as you sit up and press down through your inner heels again, the different sensations you have through your legs, let's call that mind-body presence where mind intersects the action of body. Let's call that intersection presence. Again, you don't ever intend presence. Your mind is the organ of disconnection, and it can't intend presence. It doesn't have the right stuff. Your body already is present. That's a big insight. That's going to help people with dementia. That's going to help people in a, well, in a whole bunch of things, is to help with PTSD and trauma. Is that it's the body that guarantees presence, not the mind. Again, trying to turn things upside down. Right? So that's what I mean by presence. And I'd also like you, now I'm going to go into my story a little bit. Please take off your shoes. Now, it's like, what? I don't want to take off my shoes. I don't like that part of my body. In fact, my feet smell. Or, and if I really wanted to revolt, when I publicly speak, I usually, I often have to take off socks. That doesn't work. You guys are way, that's way too far. Because the sensation of vulnerability is something that you don't want to necessarily have to deal with. But the sensation of vulnerability when you live with illness in acute care is the big monkey. It's going gonna, it's gonna to determine whether I'm successful in my life or not. If I can transform vulnerability if I'm not going to be afraid of it, and the vulnerability is allowed to include my body, and that I can get comfortable being more open. Because don't forget, when I come through healthcare, I am so vulnerable. I am so naked. I am so dependent on others. My body is not doing what I want, right? I've got all these things, and you got to help me be okay with it. And if you can't be okay with your own body. And I also want to give a defense of feet, for God's sakes. If, if you are in a smelly, dark place for 16 hours a day, how do you think you'd fare? <laughs> right? I mean, and there, our feet are a lightning rod for our disgust with our bodies. And it happens, I've been doing this a long time, it happens at all ages. Teenagers, try to get them to take off their shoes. Oh, my feet, they're ugly. 
Well, let them, let the dogs, the dogs bark more often. Let them out, let them touch the world. What is the thing you do after a long day? First thing you do when you get home from work. You take off your shoes. Why? Because it feels good. And isn't it a microcosm of the sensation of freedom? The release from constraint? It's not simple at all when you take off your shoes. In a thriving workplace, I would love it if I kept seeing people without their shoes. I'm sure there'd be some germ violation, though, in healthcare. <laughs> oh my God, we'd have to double spray. Once I go off, we'd have to double spray your feet and dip them in caramel, and then it'd be okay. <laughs> I mean, like, whatever, right? No, when you're sneaking under your desk, just take your shoes off. Have a little quiet party. <laughs> Start bringing your body to work. You've been trained that the most important part of your work is your mind. And there's some really good stuff in your mind. The question is, how are you going to deliver it? You, more than most people, most populations, know that there is truth in the human dynamic that goes beyond words. Right? How are you going to communicate? How are you going to meet me there? How are you going to meet me in the field beyond good and evil? To quote Rumi, can you do it with your mind, with your mouth, with words? Probably not. I probably need you to sit next to me better. I just need you to be there. I need you to be steadfast. But that means you need to know how to be grounded. How to sit in the presence of someone suffering and literally be there. And most of the people in this room are really good at it. But I want you to think about it more in terms of your body. So what happened to me Car accident, like Scott said, it was 1978. It was a 39 degree day in misting, 31 degrees, it felt harmless. We're driving home from Kansas City, Missouri to Duluth, Minnesota, and hit preferential icing just when we went from the Missouri over the Iowa border and just went right off an overpass. No one to blame, nothing. Went down the embankment, tumbled, my father and sister were killed. My mother and brother didn't sustain any physical injuries. I was 13 at the time. And I went through a shredder. I broke my neck at C1, my back at T4, 5, 6. I got my arms out in front of me. We didn't wear seat belts back in 1978. Got my arms in front of me, broke both my wrists, sustained an injury to my, um, collapsed the lung, sustained an injury to my pancreas that left me from, um, I went from 119 very pound, very athletic boy to 79 pounds. So I was unable to eat for 60 days. And back then, they didn't have the good nutrients that can keep mass on you. It was like this Mountain Dew-looking stuff. Probably wasn't, you know, it just kept me alive barely. So I went through, I was in a coma for three and a half days. I literally went to sleep and snuggled up against my sister and woke up three and a half days later. Everything's different. And the amount of pain, extraordinary, beyond anything there's a certain point where pain can eliminate human cohesion. Like the cohesion actually breaks. It's like water moving on an uneven floor. It just shreds. It just goes in whatever direction it's going to go. Unity of self can be overwhelmed by pain. Right? Good thing we get knocked out by it. Right? So there's an interesting story going on in the background. When I wake up finally in Des Moines, Iowa, second hospital I'm in, the, do the nurses start rolling me from side to side, and, and they don't like it. I keep passing out. I keep like just getting knocked out by it. And they, are, they are, know it's my neck, because they're touching me with their hands. And, they go, they, and they're watching me roll, and, it's not, and I'm just, poof, I'm out again. And they go to the doctors, and they say, there's something wrong with his neck. I mean, it was already, they already thought it was broken. And the doctors had chosen only to put a soft collar brace on my neck. And they're rolling me from side to side. And the nurses know it's wrong, but the doctors are looking at it saying, the x-ray is stable. And the nurses are saying, no, it's not. Something's wrong. And you know, above, C1's above breathing function. So if that goes bad, I'm dead. I can't breathe, right? And the doctors aren't moving on it, so the nurses mutiny from the doctors and go up to my mom. And they say, Paula, um, if he were our, our son, my son, it was Marilyn, was the, was the voice, um, we'd get him away from here. 
we'd get them to Mayo Clinic because we don't think the treatment is aggressive enough to help him. He's not going to live here. The injuries are too sustaining. So I imagine being my mom in that situation, right? She's lost her husband. She's lost her firstborn. She's vulnerable. She's expecting to trust, and all of a sudden there's a split, right? And there are always moments that measure everyone, right? So she goes to the neurologist the next day and asks, you know, why aren't we doing more to help Matthew, especially his neck? And the neurologist was a good man. He was coming to the end of his career in 1978, which means that he hadn't seen a lot of successful spinal cord injuries, right? It was with Vietnam and field medicine changing, our culture invested in more technology, better wheelchairs. And so he looks at Paul and said, you know, we don't even know if he's going to live the next 24 hours. His neck is not what we're worried about. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on they didn't know. And um, he said, you know, Paul, even if he makes it through the next 24 hours, his life, the life arc, this is a devastating injury. Sometimes it's better to let your loved ones go. Mama Tiger comes out. <laughs> we had to threaten a lawsuit. They didn't think I'd survive the trip to Mayo Clinic. We had to threaten a lawsuit. Um, but I want to read you a, 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 a scene of what I encountered right after the mobile home, I, uh, getting off the mobile home ICU. It's a tough scene. Ground your feet, right? Because this, this is hard. Aggressive treatment is what we wanted. Aggressive treatment is what we got. I am met by a team of doctors and brought into an open area. There is no time lapse. There is only action. A curtain is drawn, and suddenly I'm enclosed in an artificial room. I suspect that this is an emergency room, but there is no telling. The view is not great from flat on my back. The lights overhead are bright and hot, and yet my vision is dim. The faces and voices appear like shadows, conversations swirling, no apparent direction. I'm surrounded by many bodies. Two men are standing particularly close by each of my shoulders. They whisper to each other right over my chest. The quality of their voices reveals their importance. Crisp, authoritative, calm with a confident edge, but they have no faces. I see only arms, hands, torsos, and the undersides of their chins. They are holding some sort of hand tools. Unknown to me, I'm about to have four metal screws twisted directly into my skull. It is the first step in getting a halo cast, the ultimate in neck stabilization. Suddenly, two other men appear from above me and hold down my arms. Two screwdrivers move toward my temples. My skin breaks. Warmness runs into my hair. The pain is sharp and getting sharper. A horrible sound explodes inside my head, but not from the outside in, from the inside out. The screws continue to twist into my skull. The pressure is slow at first, building, and then exponential. My head no longer exists in three dimensions. No space between collapsing sides, just two rocks grinding each other. Suddenly, it's done. Assemblage of vision returns. Then out of nowhere, it begins again, twisting right above each ear. This time, I am not in that body. I land in profound silence watching a boy. He is on a table. A sheet is drooped loosely over his lower body. He seems so small. Time is off track, and I am everywhere. The doctors move, but things are held up, stretched out, turned over, pulled apart, a silent movie on a faltering projector. Suddenly, time finds its rhythm. Sounds appear again. The vacuum is broken. A timid voice I recognize as my own. Somebody help me. A path of realization, big or small, almost always starts bumpy. In my case, I was thrown off a cliff. In retrospect, I realized that this halo experience altered the course of my life. It left me with an insight. At a moment of intense physical pain, the fragile state of my living was able to move away from my body. The potential for dislocation between mind and body was dramatically revealed. The insight, however, was not the ability to disassociate. It was the silence that allowed me to, it's the silence that allowed me to maintain a life-preserving connection. Somehow, I stayed connected to that boy below me. The silence within my consciousness both separated me and connected me simultaneously. This paradoxical insight still guides my life. 
The silence within my consciousness both connects me and disconnects me simultaneously. This is one way to describe the human condition. And, and with, by silence, I'm only using a word. It's an experience. You can call it abyss. You could call it spirit. You could call it psyche. You could call it e ego, maybe. Maybe you could call it infinity. I don't know. Don't care. I know it's an experience. Do I think that I've never had such an extreme my out of body experience since then? Um, but I want you to get that the ability of the mind to fluctuate inside the body is a constant thing. The mind's in constant flux with the body. So remember that time you're driving down an interstate about 70 miles an hour? And all of a sudden you startle because you notice that you have noticed that you realize you haven't seen the landscape for 20 minutes? Like, where do you think you went? What do you think happened? How about when someone's talking and they just won't stop talking? <laughs> Suddenly you're in Charlie Brown cartoon, wah, 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 and you're thinking about your grocery store list or who knows. And then they say your name, we snap back into phase. This happens all day long. It's happened at this conference. It's happened probably since I've been talking, right? <laughs> These things happen. Right? And this is normal. Mind is in constant flux in relationship to the body. And the ability to disassociate is a survival feature built into human consciousness. It helps little kids that have been abused, helps sexual assault victims. This is a survival skill. The story of waking is a story of the price you pay getting too comfortable being disconnected. I think part of the thing that's happening in healthcare is that patients are leaving disconnected. We're appealing to their will to overcome their condition, their situation, and they're leaving less sensual, less connected, less alive. We need to touch the world. If we don't, human beings don't work. They don't work. Right? And so in a very simple way, I'm on a return body to someone that's healing. How you do that and what that means and the many different levels and shades of living in a body, I want you to get better at. So you can quietly infuse them in how you're interacting. I want you to get better at teaching the people that are going to be working more in clinic with patients, going to hospital rooms, doing little things that they're going to just see as kindness, as compassion. But I want it to have more of a body component because I know that's where they're strongest. I know it's in the intangible part of the mind-body relationship. So, um, I want to read you, you know, this silence, the word I use, you can use whatever word, and that's the word I use in, in waking, but it doesn't really matter. I'm trying to put words to a just experience that is with us all the time. Um, so here's how I defined it in waking. I wrote this chap, this paragraph over a hundred times, and I still don't like it. <laughs> because I know what I'm trying, I know what it feels like. It's hard to say. It's an experience. Silence is the word I use to describe the empty presence we experience within our experience. Between our thoughts, between each other, between ourselves and the world, we feel the silence when we daydream, when we appreciate the beauty of a sunset, or when the love of our life truly walks away. It is a feeling, it is a feeling, wait a minute, when love of our life, we appreciate the beauty of a sunset when the true life truly walks away. It is an inward sense often experienced as a longing or an ache. It is a feeling of emptiness and fullness at the same time. The silence is the aspect of our consciousness that makes us feel slightly heavy. It is the source of the feeling of loss, but also of a sense of awe. Emptiness and fullness at the same time. Anyone get the Sunday evening aches before the Monday work week? You know the one? And then, dang it, there's like a load of dishes to do still. And you just want to go to bed. You want to get horizontal. For God's sakes, could I just get horizontal? 
and then you didn't do all the, you didn't use all the dishes, but you're the one that has to clean it up. Damn it. Everyone should do their own dishes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, but you do the dishes anyway and let the warm water wash over your hands. And you think about your life and you ache a little bit and you're in love a little bit. And that's a mind-body sensation. That's not a mental sensation. That includes your body. How do you support someone there? How do you do it? I'm going to say it's much, one of the most effective ways is through the body. Right? And that causes problems, and it's a wonderful solution. Like I, and the problem it causes is, well, but like for, for mental health care professionals, I can't touch anybody. Well, that's too bad. Is that for you or the patient? Who's that for? What's that rule for? What's going on again? Who's setting the human dynamic between us? Who's setting the sacred human dynamic between us? I want to push a little bit. I want to say that's ours. Right? There are ethical things we got to worry about, and well, we can talk about those. We had like three weeks to hang out together. Right? I get it. Right? All right. So this level of sensation, how do you support the silence in another human being? These are the questions, right? So I'm going to ask you to come up on stage with me. Will you take off your jacket? So we're going we're gonna to do an exercise here. I call it an exercise. That's way too whatever. Um, we're going to support another human being. We're going to do it through the spine. So you turn and face the other way. Already she's vulnerable, right? Giving up your back to somebody. She actually saw me before. I taught yoga in Virginia Beach and she was at it, so I actually know she trusts me. <laughs> right? But it would be even more effective if she didn't know me because she could be worried I'm making faces back here. There's a whole bunch of things. But I'm not, but she doesn't know that. Remember, the integration of what you cannot control and feel is going to be integral to my healing process. Right? You can't give me all the answers. So what you're going to do, you're going to partner up in a second, and you're going to put your hand right between the shoulder blades, and you're going to go gently in and up. But this is more yoga for the person receiving. Do you know how to receive support? Can you let this in? Can you make a simple touch be transformative? Oh, yes, you can. I know you can. This is a crucial exercise in a lot of our trainings because this, in order for this to be an exchange, there has to be equilibrium, right? There are a whole bunch of subtle things. If I'm afraid of her body and, I, and I'm kind of like not comfortable with it, whether I'm touching or not, we're not as connected. This is okay, right? If I violate her conditions of safety, Right? Even subtly. So I'm going to push a little bit too hard. Right? And she goes off, but don't fall. Right? She goes off. Or she leans too hard on me. Lean back. I got gotcha. you. Right? And I have to hunker up. Right? The exchange between us is not as effective. It's so subtle that if I actually move and get too directly behind her and cross my own midline right, with my arm and have to hold up my arm, we're not as connected. If I want the exchange to nourish us both, it matters where I am, how I am, not what I intend. They're just simple transference truths. How do you support the silence in another human being? The emptiness part of consciousness. So for you, some of you are going to be a tall drink of water with a short drink of water. That person's going to probably have to kneel. Because if you're trying to bend over and be in, in a physically stressed, you know, harder position, you're not going to, the exchange isn't going to be as good. So you're looking for the place where you can both, where the role of the giver is as important. And as she re receives, there, you feel that right there, right? You'll feel it in your whole body. Now, what's really going to bake your noodle is when she receives, I feel it in my paralysis. It transcends a severed spinal cord. 
this level of sensation is literally transcendent. I'm sure it's got something to do with the nervous system. I don't even care. But that's where I need to get supported. Okay? All right. So partner up. Find your partner. I'll talk you through it. Yeah, no, no, go, go down and find a, go, to, go down and find a partner down there. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to. Oh, God, I hate touching people, right? And if you don't have a partner, raise your hand. It's okay. And then don't you feel like, oh, I better introduce myself. Hi, my name's Mike. Because I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the idea that you're going to touch me. No, don't introduce yourselves. I'm heckling that. That was sarcasm. That was one of your attempts to solve vulnerability by using words. Not to say that it's bad, but guess what? I'm laying in bed and I just had a car bounce over my chest. I don't need to talk more. I'm barely there. I need you to sit down and let me know you're here, right? So it's not always. Sometimes you introduce yourself, sometimes you don't. It's an art. How you interact with people is an art. You know it. You have good days and bad days, days that you can connect with people and days you can't. All right, so the first person is going to turn around and give up their back. And try to be open. So being able to be open is not something you intend it's something you allow. Presence is not an intention. It's an allowance of the existential condition. Be here. You are naked here. Here being the big H. Not literally naked now. Although you're naked under your clothes. Don't ever forget that. Right? All right. So here comes the hand. Between the shoulder blades, lightly. A little bit down, some of you are a little too high, a little, you know, right through, right, yeah. And then you kind of open with the palm of your hand, but don't push him. You're supporting another human being. Now, I know from doing as much yoga that this support actually eases sensation in the person's body. It makes them feel more grounded. And the thing is about the human mind, it's such a bummer. The human mind learns better when it loses stuff, not when it gains stuff. So now, as the hand goes away, you might not notice how great it felt because you, you've, you've habitualized touch. Watch when the hand goes away. You're going to miss your buddy. And you feel that? All of a sudden you feel heavier again? Slightly heavier, right? All right, here it comes again. Receive it better. Find equilibrium between the two of you. The person adjusting, ground your feet, be open. Person, as they start to do that, can you feel how your, the feeling changes? Everything's connected. The silent part of the mind-body relationship's connected. Don't lean too back hard on them. And again, when it leaves, Take your hand slowly away. The world gets heavier again, doesn't it? What the hell? <laughs> right? But now you owe a karmic debt. Change, switch, other person's turn. Stand there in a pause before you, and if you stuck your hand on them really fast, I would call that, if you already have your hand on the person right now, I would call that that you're a pathological giver. <laughs> right? We call those in our training PGIs. We have pathological giver interventions. We have a sit down going, wait, but... On a more serious note, if you don't allow me to have my baseline of sensation, I don't recognize your help as well. Our rush to try to fix things and rush in is not consistent with the truth of suffering. I actually need my space to suffer. 
And then I need to know your company. Don't rush in. If you rush in, you're going to burn out. If that's how you're living your work, you're going to burn out. Right? All right, so here comes the hand. Get really good at receiving it because that's a gift you give to the giver. If you let in and let yourself be supported, they can feel it through their hands, through human contact. How do you let in? Don't just think it. Open. Feel the lightness that comes into your upper thoracic. What if this space in the chest is the source of compassion? Good, and then slowly release. And notice how the world, and even if you just miss the heat, right? But don't you feel a little heavier again? Here it comes again. I actually think we need to train patients how to receive better. This is what I mean by supporting the silence in another human being. And then slowly release. What do you, that sensation of support, isn't it kind of near the sensation of gratitude? Interesting. All right, have a seat back down. All right, so I'm already going to run late. I'm not going to run late, but I'm already running out of time, and I can't stand that. So everyone put your lips together. It's interesting, though, when you have a sensation of share that includes your spine, it often wants to barf out through the mouth. <laughs> Don't forget, the mouth is the top of your spine. If you have an injury at C1 and they have to do surgery, often they operate through the mouth. Why do you think a smile's in every language? Everyone make your lips really tight and clench your teeth. That closes off the top of your spine. That's what you do when you're stressed out. You shut down interaction with the world and it makes stress worse, right? Why do you think we kiss with our mouths? Relax your jaw. Begin the hint of a smile. Make your lips soft. Can you see how that's more open? Now, you know that smile we get at the holidays when they, when they want you to buy more? <laughs> Fake your smile right now. Sure. Feel how closed down you are. That's why you don't trust that smile. It's actually not as open on the spine. So I could go on all day about what I think the body is and what the spine can do, right? But let's move on now kind of to a little bit of the more practical stuff about how to teach this stuff. Um, I, let's just assume there's a transcendent level of sensation within human consciousness, okay? So I feel kind of safe saying that to this group. You might have different belief systems that reveal it, but pretty much there's a really cool energy here, right? That's just true. Right? And everyone's going to get to it a different way. So if we assume that, if we assume that level of connection, how do we share it? How do we like figure out how to communicate that in a way? How do you communicate company? Because quite frankly, you can never, ever really know what I've gone through. It just my story is more overt than that. But like I just was working with a guy, Bruce Kramer, who died of ALS a couple years ago. I can't imagine ALS. What I can do is, make, is allow or make space for, the fat, for that, and then I can touch his body and let him know that I know what it's like to feel lonely. I know that feeling. Now, I can say that, but if I also touch, it goes at a deeper level. And you can use words to touch, too. It's not all going to be 
It doesn't all have to be physical. Um, so one of the things in talking to Scott that, that, that getting back to the use of self and concepts of presence, I suspect, but I don't know for sure, that most of your thoughts about ways to be inward are being led mentally, right? Um, so it'd be like the mindful thing. Like I know that maybe, maybe some of you in curriculum, you, you use body scans or mindfulness or to be mindful of the butterflies in your stomach or when you're anxious and be aware mindfully of body sensation. But I want to say to you, that's only one form of inwardness. I would also say that prayers are a form, praying is a form of inwardness. It's a way to access a kind of sensation that we can, and then you put a word like sacred on it, right? That's a way to be inward too. Not to say that, you know, like that, that these are all ways that you're already, already doing it. Um, there, you know, and, and there are, I mean, just kind of go through and we kind of think, well, if my mind's aware of it, then that must be the way, right? But so, but what if, what if, like, alignment taught inwardness, right? So everyone just slouch in your chair for a minute, okay? So this would be, I would call your sits bones feeling like butter, the bones in your butt right now, right? They're like butter, and it's doing something to your spine. Now, again, now come out to the edge of the chair, more to the middle of the chair, and make your sits bones like knives, sharp. In other words, be more aware of the inner edge of your sitting bones. And notice what happens to your chest. Now make them like butt up. Now, in having you go through an exercise like this, I'm asking you to discriminate different sensations. Come back and make your sits bones like knives. Right now, I could have taught you just to lift your chest more. And by the way, all of you need to get your chest open more. When Scott said, you'll see people laying over bolsters, seriously. You should be doing passive chest openings. You should feel what it feels like to open, not against gravity, but with gravity. Let gravity help you open. Don't always fight against gravity, right? So there's all sorts of ways by actually asking you to like start to discriminate different parts of your body. When I said, lift your chest in and your sits bones and stretch down to the inner edge of your heels. By, dis by making my body, discriminating it into parts, not just observing what sensations I'm feeling, but including action to discriminate. So my mind starts to have to go inward, right, as a sensation. To feel like, oh yeah, okay, okay, and, and to find that. That's a form of inwardness. And you're going to want to actually help people be inward, grounded, and act. Right? All right. So another one would be everyone stand up. Right? So stand with your feet together. This is a basic yoga pose. It's called Tadasana. And, and the put feet together, right? Unless that's going to make you fall over. And that's why I'd rather you not be in your shoes right now. Because it's amazing how much better you're going to feel if you let your feet touch more of the world. Seriously. I'm not kidding. It seems so simple. Oh, it can't be that simple. Oh, no, you're going to be surprised. Like, you, like putting your feet in grass, because it's spring, and we're getting pretty happy about grass right now, <laughs> right? Touching things more with your feet, you'd be surprised, right? So, so now, in Tadasana, you lift up through the core. Your arms are at your sides. You're trying to ground down, push down through your heels, but lift out of your ankles. So you're getting multiple directions going right now, right? And by the way, that's one of the gifts of being able to live in a functional body, is being able to move in multiple directions at once. So you're hitting down through your heels, and you're lifting up through the core, right? Lifting your chest, rolling the shoulders back some, stretching down through the arms. Now already, instead of just asking you to observe, I'm trying to ask you to do, and use the doing as a form of inwardness. Right now, soften the inside of your mouth. Learning to soften your organs of perception. Soften around the temples and the jaw, but don't lose the intensity of the lift. 
But still, as you're acting, soften. Soften your eyes, the temples, the jaw, the inside of the mouth. So now we're conjoining two more sensations, right? We're conjoining action with release. Oh my goodness, this is one of the keys to a healthy life. Being able to act and have relief. Support while acting. Again, simple things, not so simple. Okay, so then now like release and don't be as an attentive and, and like, like you're standing in the grocery store line. That'd be way over to one hip. Go ahead and do that one, right? Or at a cocktail party. You know, you know why when you're at a cocktail party and someone just wants to start talking and just want to keep drinking? Like, oh my God, will you shut up? <laughs> Could you be more self-absorbed? Please, God, get me a martini again. Right? That's the one. Now, bring, now balance more in the four corners of your feet again. Wait, four corners of my feet? I just added an instruction, didn't I? To actually feel the four corners of your feet, look how you have to go inward again. But I don't want you just to go inward to observe. I want you to inward and receive. So when you balance on the four corners of your feet, and then lift out of your ankles and up through your chest, so up through your chest, through your mouth, through the top of your head, stretch your arms down gently while you're still lifting up. Again, here's inward again. This, you have to teach grounding in action, not just passive grounding, right? And then <clears throat> slowly release. And then notice what happens, how the world gets heavier and your posture goes back the way it does. And there's all sorts of things. Now inhale and take your arms up over your head. While you're doing this, hit down through your heel, heels. Mm -hmm. Turn the tricep in towards the face, palms toward each other. Mm -hmm. Shoulder blades down, stretch beyond your fingertips. Hit down through your heels, breathe. Take up more space. What if you started living in more space? Right, instead of always. Good, and then take your arms down. Take your feet, now you gotta kinda spread out a little bit, find some space, take your feet three and a half to four feet wide and take your arms wide, right? Just don't, try not to plunk the person in front of you or beside you, right? Take your arms wide. Remember the game Light Bright? Put light in your joints, put light in your ankles, your knees, your hips, your shoulders, your elbows, your wrists. And don't forget your head's a joint. Get bigger in every direction. Get bigger in every direction. If I had my way, you'd stand like this while you waited for your coffee in the morning at the coffee maker. <laughs> you'd get bigger in space. All right, take your arms down, feet together. And so now stand back into the asana, but this time I want you to, you guys take, because you can stand so easily, like I do work with people with traumatic brain injuries all the time, this is really hard for someone with a traumatic brain injury or stroke, okay? So I want you to stand into Tadasana. Try to keep your eyes open, but be connected. Balance in the whole room. Have your mind open and receive. So you're not just standing and balancing on the four corners of your feet, but you're trying to balance in relationship to whatever your mind can perceive in the whole room. And it's not just your mind, it's your spine. Be in three dimensions. The mind's gonna like push away from three dimensions. It doesn't like the vulnerability. It's gonna wanna control more by making it two dimensional. Be in three dimensional space. Allow what's behind you, above you, below you, and especially again what's behind you. But try to like, wait, there's a wall up the way. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually be here. Okay, now ever so slightly come forward on the balls of your feet. Don't come off your heels though. Just shift your weight. Now, right now, do you feel more or less connected to the room around you? Less. Muscular action is going to disconnect you from the space around you. This is a big insight for yoga poses. Now, go behind the balance point. Again, your neck has to grip. You're having to shut down. You're not receiving in the same way. Now, balance on the four corners of your feet. Teaching balance in a safe way teaches inwardness, teaches connection. 
These are some of the things I'd like you to start integrating into your curriculum, right? Integrating with who you're teaching is like do some mind-body stuff that isn't just being mindful, but is actually trying to utilize the body and connection rather than disconnection, right? And simple things. Now I can ask you, everyone lift your toes up. Press down through the inner crease of the big toe mound. Just kind of press diagonally down. Move your pinky toe mound off to the side really hard. Harder than that. Harder than that. Is your pinky finger helping you? Yeah. Can you feel that? Crazy, huh? Yeah. What you just ran into was a serious limitation of the mind. When the mind is overwhelmed with variables, it'll grip the snot out of whatever it feel it can. And it'll make you think you're working your pinky toe. Like if I just work that pinky finger hard enough, that must be my pinky toe, right? That's why when things are getting complicated, people are clenching their jaw and pressing their tongue and surfing their mouth. They, there's too much stuff coming at them and they do things and they lock into their body, right? That's not the way to deal with hard times. Right, so the good thing about the pinky finger mistake is you didn't miss by much. The, the neural pathways between the pinky finger and the pinky toes are close. So you miss by about three neural pathways, right? So it's not that you shouldn't use your finger. Don't lie to let your pinky finger think you're moving your, moving your pinky toes. So lift your toes up again, press down to the crease of the inner big toe mound, spread the pinky toe fin mounds us away, and then keep that and set your toes back down. Do you feel the lift up through your chest? I never once mentioned your chest. Sensations transcend it. Has to do with gravity, has to do with balance. These are the things I've had to learn as a paralyzed yoga practitioner. This is what I teach around the world. How do we get this part back into the rehabilitation model? How do we get this back into human resilience? How do we have them access stuff? All right, and then have a seat back down. Um, Sean, will you come up here? Uh, Scott, and, and come on up. We're gonna do another partner thing. I know I'm running out of time. I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it. Okay, one more partner thing. <clears throat> Scott's gonna sit in the chair. Just sit down. Molly, who's our development director at Mind Body Solutions, and a yoga teacher, just because I, I don't have to like, explain it as much. So you kind of come out on, the, out on the edge of your chair. I want you to get you across, across something to you. It doesn't take much body awareness to be transformative. To feel the sensation of support, it doesn't take much. That, it's amazing. So Scott's gonna take his arms over his head. He's gonna sit on the edge of his chair, right? He's got tight arms, we're not gonna shame him for that. <laughs> He's got tight shoulders right here. There's some serious strength right there, right? He's going to turn his palms and try to go up. And if he, he's going to just go up higher. You can go up higher. Yeah, you got it. All right, hit down through your sitting bones. And so what Molly, and I'm going to let him suffer for a while. The joke in our training is that you got to let people suffer before you help them, right? <laughs> right? Which is actually just saying let them have their own level of sensation before relief comes because people don't study relief. They take it, right? You want to learn, you want to teach people how to receive Right, and then you're gonna take, put your hands on both lightly, a thumb and index finger on both, right? And you're gonna have everything freaking change. And it's not very much, your arms are gonna feel lighter. You're gonna actually feel energy go down through your sitting bones. And then if you didn't notice how good it feels, she's gonna not, she's gonna let go and the world's gonna get heavier again, right away. Your mind needs to know where it is in space. Here she comes back again. It gets conditions of safety through the body. It calms down. There's more relief. But now, relief is the beginning of every action. That's what you learn in yoga, right? That you've got to like come from relief rather than from effort, right? And then it goes away and he's still there and it's hard again and dang, it takes a village. All right, and then take your arms down. Partner up quick. We gotta go fast, because I've been talking too long. <laughs> Just have a seat.
Take your arms up over your head. Start suffering immediately. <laughs> Ground both feet. Come over to the edge of your chair. Take your shoulder blades down. Stretch your arm, go beyond your fingertips. Feel that forgotten country again. You can actually support your own effort, too, by using your body. It's not just about good mechanics. It's about using your body to create ease. All right, and then here comes the touch on the wrist, just the thumb and index finger, both at the same time. Right, on the bone, right? And if you didn't feel that, how much relief that actually was, here it goes away. See how much heavier you are? That's the subtle body. We need to rehabilitate the subtle body, not just mentally. All right, and then here comes the touch again. This level of sensation and ease that you get, that you got when the hand was on the back of the sternum, human conscious has this subtler level of sensation. So now, as the person releases, how do you keep it yourself? You have to work your legs, don't you? Can you feel I have to work your legs more? During your day, you have to work your legs more. And then take your arms down. You gotta switch quick. Arms up, start suffering. Let the suffering commence. Roll the tricep towards the ears, drive the shoulder blades down, hit down through the city bones, reach up for the sky. Right? Can you feel your, your urge to want to help them because you know how much it's going to help when you touch their wrists? Right? Try to get your arms as much straight over your head as you can. Okay, now here comes the touch on the wrist, each side of the wrist, thumb and index finger. Do you know how to receive? Make it a party. Let it in. Now here comes the, the you know, release and just watch how much heavier things get. Can you feel the change? Back in again. If I want to support the intangible part of your consciousness, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much. Good, and then slowly release. Go back to your spot. So here's the deal, and I, I got to take some questions. Here's the deal. So what I want you to get is that the, I, here's four sensations I would start trying to figure out how to integrate into your curriculum to try to get people that you're training to go be with people that are suffering that I think would be really helpful. And the only way you're going to be able to pass this on in your curriculum is if you start doing some of the stuff. So the sensation of grounding. It doesn't, it's like, wait, I know, but grounding is physical too. Here's some couple things for you to try. Put a, sometimes put a heavy weight, put a sandbag on your lap while you're sitting at your desk. That grounding sensation feels really good. When I had you actually engage your feet, Muscular action is a form of grounding. Laying horizontally on your bed is a form of grounding. I don't, there are a lot of ways to create the sensation of grounding, but you've got to study the sensation itself, what it feels like. Because as you start to study it in your own case, you're going to be able to teach it in the ways that already fit your curriculum. What I want to get to is you don't all of a sudden have to become like have a, add 10 more new things, you could. You just have to teach some of the body awareness slightly differently. You have to change a little bit about how you're teaching inwardness and recognize the difference between mentally driven inwardness and bodily sensed inwardness, right? So another sensation that comes, when you sit on the, come up on the edge of your chair, make your sits bones like knives, all those things are grounding instructions, right? They made you ground, but do you feel how you expanded? 
there's a profound relationship between the sensation of grounding and the sensation of expansion. Start studying expansion from inside to out. In how you sit, in how you move. Start to figure out exercise. And there's stuff. If you want to see a video about how to teach adaptive yoga to people in wheelchairs, I highly recommend our DVD, Beyond Disability at Mind Body Solutions, because it'll give you a whole bunch of ways to teach grounding and sitting, right? And the feet and, the, and, and expansion, right? That's an, a, another balance. I've already gone through that as a sensation. Figure out, like, how do you balance your head over your neck? Try that right now. Did anyone notice is once you try to balance your head over your neck, you feel an ease going on through your whole body? Can you feel that yet? All that's happening. There's more happening in your body than you know. Your brain just kind of habituates it because it's worried about the next snack break, right? <laughs> and finally, the sensation of rhythm. Watch someone in a lot of pain. It can be both negative and positive. We're trying to teach nurses to rock and roll on their feet while they're standing at the nurse's station. We're trying to get them to like feel what it is to shift gravity. Because rhythm is a form of unity. Balance is a form of unity. Grounding and without boundary. Here's another one of those mind-body lines. You can't expand without boundary. So like when your arms are over your head, they didn't know, you don't know when they were, and someone just touched your wrists. All it did was give you boundary, and didn't you feel more grounded? And didn't you feel a sense like your arms kind of started to raise up? Those, like, start paying attention to sensations. And, you know, come to my yoga class, right? <laughs> but, because I teach a lot of this, right? But this is the level where if you start supporting someone, like, for example, have people practice, like, cupping each other's joints. So, Scott, just come up here quick, okay? So, like, like, if I have a seat, it turns out that you have more sensors in your joints than you, your brain has a whole bunch of sensors in your joints. So if I can create ease here, I'm actually touching the brain directly, and I get him to start, I'm just putting pressure on both sides or behind his sternum and behind here, right? Right, this is comforting. This is like why you like hugs, right? But now this is also a, an expansive sensation. You, I would teach your people how to like distribute relief. Boundary, grounding, expansion, and breathing. This isn't rocket science. It's paying attention to what's already happening and getting comfortable doing it. Thanks. Right, so my, my advice on teaching this stuff is practice it yourself. Figure out simple ways you can include it. And know, as, you're, as the patient, I'm so hungry for this kind of company. I've been so knocked off my moorings. Ground people's ankles when they're laying in bed. How you doing today, Scott? Touch, give them boundary again. When you're in a lot of pain, you need boundary to surround pain. There's a reason why little kids, when they're hurt, my son would get hurt, he'd run for a hug. He'd run for a hug, not because he needed sympathy. He'd run for a hug because he needed boundary around the pain. This is a simple insight. You've got to figure out how to get it into what you're doing, because it's not going to be coming from the doctor. Not even the nurses very often. PT or OT, it's not here. All right, I'm going to take some questions. Thanks. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I feel like I keep learning this stuff over and over and just forgetting it. And then I right. my eyes when I find out we're going to come do like mind body stuff. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, this is awesome. 
Um, my question, I was thinking as you were presenting about how whether I wear my collar or I don't, I just have a badge that says chaplain, I represent a role of people who have a history of bad touch. Can you give us some guidance about well, negotiating Well, with bad touch, touch I, mean, I mean, on a real practical level, and don't think about what I've said is just about touch. I'm trying to reveal a sense of ease in the mind-body relationship, and the quickest way for me to do it for you is through touch, okay? How you are, how you enter the room, whether you actually fully sit down in the chair next to the person. Maybe you sit down and exhale, oh, and you say, hey, I need to ground just for a second. And you lean forward on your own finger bones, and you give that moment of extra, for yourself too, right? Extra, extra pause. That also communicates, right? For people that have bad touch, or you, you ask them, but Touch away from ankles, right? Get away from it. And, and the, quite frankly, someone that struggles with that, you got to come to our PTSD training and trauma thing, right? But, but in general, if after having a trauma, if I don't have, if I don't let the world ever touch me again, my injury lasts forever. Most likely, I'm safer with you. Ask, go slow, feel it in your own body. You don't have to physically touch. You could just sit there and go, hey, let's just take a moment here. Usually you'd start the prayer part, right? But as soon as you start the prayer, you've got me thinking about something else and not being in my own body. Before we pray, let's just sit here for a second and feel and ground. There's ways to do it without touching too. All right. Next question or over here. Uh, thank you for the experience. Um, what would be your number one tip for breathing? For what? Breathing. Breathing? Mm -hmm. um, learn to breathe into relief. It's not about the breathing technique as much. It's learning to actually, and also recognizing that, you know, it's not about the depth of your breath or whatever. It's like, and especially if you have more boundary, you can breathe better, right? So like when you had your arms over your head, and then once I touched the, the, the wrists, right, notice you felt ease when that happened. That's a great opportunity to breathe. Okay, so think about also that breathing is, you breathe for the parts you can't control and touch. The breath is a transcendent mechanism that in, t t bridges the intangible with the tangible, right? So I would practice body awareness and quality breathing over quantity breathing. Breathing through the nose, if it's, older people have a harder time breathing through the nose, breathing through the nose, help them be aware to soften their jaw and the inside of their mouth and feel grounded so their breath actually touches more of their body. I would make the breathing be not about the actual exercise of breathing, because that's hard for people, a lot of people. I'd make it be more about the quality of breathing and knowing that you need to be grounded and feel safe to breathe well. That help? All right. Last one, <clears throat> getting cut at the knees. I'll, t I'll stay out and I'll, at, I'll sit out there and answer questions, okay? Um, I know that yoga is a practice um, originated in South, Afri uh, South Asia, East yep. Africa, indigenous cultures here in this land. And um, I would really love it if uh, when you gave presentations, you would honor that first, that would be really, that it comes from somewhere, that it's grounded somewhere. And then the other thing I'd like to point out is that a lot of our patients have these tools, but um, they're not allowed to use it in the healthcare system. So as supervisors and um, SES is we're you're encouraging us to learn more and teach it to each other, but our patient giving the patient space to be able to, to do this themselves, I think also would be helpful. And I think that's something we all have to hear. Is there a question or is that just a comment? 
That was my request. Encouraging and patience. All right, thank you.